traffic. And, and I think, you know, we were fortunate enough to have that open space there at the university and have those types of conversations, you know, with uh, guest speakers that will come in to talk about science, to talk about like different topics that, you know, we would think that are so um, separate from religion or separate from the belief of God. But I think sometimes, you know, those strengthen our understanding of God. Hello, everyone. This is Out of the Box Podcast, where Steele and I, your host, uh, talk about outside of the box ideas. Today, we have a pretty awesome topic. It's does God exist? And a little bit about the insights that we have. Um, We are both Christian. And so we're excited to talk about, you know, our perspectives. And hopefully this is an unbiased uh, talk that we can show you know, not only our personal experiences, but also uh, some scientific research that uh, we've done uh, ourselves. So I know, Steel, uh, if you want to kind of kick it off, just uh, give him some context about what you have done, maybe uh, some of the projects that you have behind this topic. Yeah, I'll do a little quick snippet uh, to save us some time so we can dive into some of, some of those uh, philosophical questions. But uh, basically, I've been writing this book uh, I didn't plan on it at all. It just started as a project I was for fun because when I was in my undergrad at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, uh, I I feel like it really helped me help strengthen my faith because I feel like at that point in my life, I was maybe getting farther away from church, but my friends there kind of helped me, brought, brought me back just being in that environment. And sophomore year, I... Basically, the core curriculum at the university is philosophy. And the first philosophy course I took was freshman year. And that one really opened my mind up to philosophy for the first time. And it got me really interested in it. And I had to, we had to do these discussion posts every week, um, a certain way uh, to practice philosophical like arguments and along with um, like other students and stuff. And that I think really got me interested in, in that in like philosophical debate and arguing things with logic and just basic philosophy, you know? And so I was like, well, wouldn't that be, one summer I was like, wouldn't that be interesting if I tried to kind of apply all this, uh, all these philosophical skills and arguing techniques to God, you know, to my own uh, belief in God, just to see what would happen, to see where I can go with it. And so I started doing that on my own, just kind of writing notes and writing stuff on Microsoft Word. And then it turned into something bigger because then I started doing research and then got really deep into human consciousness and what human consciousness even is. We don't even, there's so many definitions of human consciousness. It's really fascinating. That's Um, something I'm I'm interested in kind of dwelling in maybe a little bit later, the, the unconscious mind and you know, what, what that has to do with the existence of God, right. Or, or at least our ability to perceive, you know, our concept of God. Yeah, I'll leave you in uh, one second. I'm just going to do something. All right. So while Stu uh, takes, a, takes a quick break, um, I wanted to share a little bit about my experience and a little bit about my context. So as a Christian, you know, I'm, I'm cradle Catholic, uh, grew up as um, a Christian all my life, and I've been doing this um you know, ever since I was little, I've always been uh, part of the Christian community. My family always went to church, different things like that. So um, I've always had the idea of God in my life. But, you know, I think in college is usually when we kind of fight that idea and, you know, begin to ask questions because it's it's unfortunate that when we're younger, a lot of people say, well, don't ask questions, you know, don't question the process, don't question what it is, you know, don't question God, you know, but I think it's, it's normal to question just because it gets you to a deeper understanding of what you actually believe, you know, it it's in the contrary, it's doing a benefit to question. And it's not a threat. It's not a uh, going against anyone's beliefs to question. It's just basically looking at it in a different perspective. You know, I think kids are so smart. They have such great questions. Uh, but then once we get to adulthood, 
we've been told not to question things so much that we forget how good questions are. Um, and I actually have a quote here that I wrote the other day. It's called, it says, questions are the start to curiosity. Curiosity is the start of an adventure. And I really think, you know, faith in itself is an adventure. You know, there's its ups and downs. There's its good moments and its bad moments. There's the seeking, the, the looking around, the asking. And so that's why I think questions in itself uh, do lead to a higher and better understanding uh, in this case of God and who he is and what he plays in our day-to-day life. Yeah, I really like what you said about uh, not being afraid to ask questions and kind of like, like what you're saying of uh, children being discouraged from asking questions. Because I've kind of seen that, or I've seen it portrayed in like movies and stuff. And I don't know if the movies are exaggerating because I know that times were like really different back then too. And when the church is more strict on certain things, I guess, or or like, you know, like I would see like a movie like showing like Sunday school and, and like uh, a priest or somebody works there's like criticizing the child for asking questions about God, you know, and and that probably did happen quite often back then, you know, and, and my optimistic self is like, hopefully now it's less that way. At least that was my experience with St. Mary's. Like I got more of an idea of like, you know, it's OK to ask questions and they kind of encourage mm-hmm. you to explore questions about God instead of discouraging it. And I'm sure it depends on the environment too. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. And and I think that's one of the healthy ways, right. To have conversations when both sides of the the platforms, you know, whether you believe or don't believe, you know, have that open space to not judge each other for for what one believes, but mainly to understand what the the concepts and the things that they they're saying, you know, if they make sense and, um, you know, have a congruent sense of what, what's going on, right. Uh, specifically in the topic. And, and I think, you know, we were fortunate enough to have that open space there uh, at the university and have those types of conversations, you know, with, uh, guest speakers that will come in to talk about science, to talk about like different topics that, you know, we would think that are so, um, separate from religion or separate from the belief of God. But I think sometimes, you know, those strengthen our understanding of God, right? You know, neurology, uh, science, all that mathematics, music, you know, all that, I think, in a way, brings back to, to its origin, you know, the creation. And I think that's, that's, if there is a creation, you know, in effect, there is a creator, right? And I think that's one of the ideas that um, that's been uh, a little bit, I guess, debated over years, right? You know, because uh, a lot of scientists have come up with the idea that of a self-creating universe, right? That in itself, it just created itself, right? And you know, in in our in our idea, the idea of God, you know, is is the creator, right? So. I think that's where the contradiction is. Some people are saying that it was self-created, the universe. And then another one is that there was a creator, there was a person uh, or being that actually made all of this in, in, our, in our earth, in our universe, right? And right. so I think that's probably a good start. If you want to maybe touch up, up a little bit on that idea still with yeah. what you have in your book as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the book itself has, uh, I mean, I didn't get to finish, but like it started from writing and then it turned into a huge long book, a uh, hundred or so pages long with various topics. One, one of which that you're talking about uh, is can we attribute the universe to being created by a creator or to it being self-made as the, uh, I guess we could call naturalist uh, proposed or there's so many different labels for everything, you know, I guess say yeah. naturalists, I guess and, biologists, scientists, but then it's like not all scientists are atheists, not all scientists are this, you know? So it's, yeah, it's, that's when it gets yeah, that's true. But yeah. And as yeah. we go, if you want to explain some, some of the jargon that, that you yeah. mentioned, um, yeah, definitely. And I'll keep you accountable if, if maybe there's some, some word that, that might be uh, uh, foreign to, to the listeners. Right. Yeah. So the creation of the universe uh, my my struggle with that one 
is, you know, I can find a lot of, I can find a lot of you know, information on, on like, <clears throat> like the fine tuning of the universe. I'm sure you've probably heard of that argument, how everything is so specifically fine tuned that if something was even off by a decimal, then, you know, a lot of the things we see now wouldn't exist. The, the problem like I struggle with is because the atheist argument to that is uh, that you're just saying the God of the gaps and the God of the gaps is saying that you're just seeing these gaps in the universe. Like for example, uh, how do you explain life coming from non-life, you know, and you're just using these gaps that exist in nature and, and adding God to it. And that's what that argument is. And I'm not going to lie. It's a, it's a challenging argument to, you know, to debate, at least for me. It so, is. so do you mean you that, ever, yeah. do you mean that, um, what, 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 what is the, the God of gaps? I, I, I quite right. didn't understand. Yeah. So the God, yeah. So the God of the gaps. So, so think of gaps like, uh, like holes in our understanding of the universe. So one hole would be why, why does the universe exist? You know, like, I guess, if you kind of look at it in perspective of like, if we assume okay, that so like the the questions that we don't quite know the answer for, right? We yeah. can just defer like, okay, that was God, right? And and basically, the, the atheist counter argument to that is, I mean, to us being Christians, uh, claiming that God created the universe is well, you're just doing the God of the gaps. You're just you're just saying the universe exists because God, without any other, I guess, explanation. And, and I admit that that's a, uh, it's a challenging, you know, it's a challenging counter argument. And it's interesting to like, think about, you know? Yeah. It, but my question still is, you know, for, for, uh, for those, you know, for, for those who don't believe, or maybe bring up that, that, um, that argument, then why, then why does that happen? Right. And, and I, I think, I think it's a, uh, you know, whenever there's a gray area, I guess like how how you said, you know, the gaps. Whenever there's a gray area, you know, it's hard to explain because, you know, we haven't come to the, the evolution, I guess, in in our in our way of of thinking, to actually be able to, uh, attribute that to a certain, you know, scientific law or or anything like that, and so. Right. I guess for, for believers, you know, it's, it's easy just to, to, uh, to uh, refer to God as, as making that event happen. Right. Um, And I can see, you know, like how, how uh, I guess for, for those non-believers, how woo woo that can sound to, to them, you know, in in the way of, you know, understanding God. But I think, I think it's, it's focusing too little on, on that detail. Right. And, and for sure, you know, it, and I think it's, it's, it's a great argument um, to, to bring up, but at the end of the day, you know, okay, well, yes, let's say, you know, those, those gaps, you know, we can attribute them to, to God. Right. But even if they weren't, you know, attributed to God, then how do you explain those those things? You know, yeah, you still like it's not, still like up yeah, in the I see air. What you're so you're 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 saying like kind of like um, it's still the problem is still there. Like just saying that oh, you're just using the god of the gaps. It doesn't get rid of the problem that the Christian yeah. thing that there's no there's still events that are not explained by right. by science like, in itself. Oh yeah, and like even the creation of life itself from non life is extremely complicated. People don't realize how complicated it is. Like scientists have been able to pinpoint it down to specific points in time of like DNA and RNA construction, but they can only go so far deconstructing that even, you know, and even that's kind of limited. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not like, an, I don't want to claim to be an expert either, come off that way. Like I'm not a biologist, yeah. but just the stuff that I've read, I think is fascinating. Um, but another topic we could talk about that kind of ties into this. Well, why would you say it's God? Because then another argument that uh, is made is that, well, there's 12 other religions. And then on top of that, there's other religions that people have also created. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's Greek mythology, there's 
you know, zoos and all that. And then there's uh, new stuff like Satanism, Pastafarianism. Pastafarianism is basically kind of a parody, though it doesn't really count. Yeah. A uh, Jedi, you know, turn Jedi into a religion. But it's like, you know, you yeah, there, there's so many like, gods, like, right. which god are we talking about? And I, right. I guess, and dude, you it's know what's more fascinating. I figured out that a, a lot of that, like some religions, like Buddhism, I believe. They don't even believe in God. You know, they're actually an atheistic religion. They just believe in, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. But and like Nirvana and stuff. As I understand, it's like about energy and stuff like that. But they don't believe mm. in a creator of the universe. So that, to me, that doesn't count. Like, that's not a competition for Christianity because they don't even believe in God to begin with. That's, I'm not saying it's the same thing as atheism, but it's atheistic in nature. And the Christian God is the God that me and you believe in, uh, Jesus. That's what makes our, our religion unique. And then there's the Abrahamic God that Judaism believes in. Jews believe in. They still believe in the Abrahamic God of the Old Testament that me and you also believe in. The only difference is they just don't believe in the New Testament. They don't believe that Jesus was the son of God. They may even mm -hmm. acknowledge, and some atheists and, and historians even acknowledge that Jesus was probably a real person and a, a great philosopher. Uh, someone said, was it C.S. Lewis who said, either Jesus is a brilliant genius or he's a madman who's crazy, either, you know, but yeah. they still acknowledge that he existed as a human being. It's just the difference is they don't know, they don't believe, they don't go to our level where we believe that he was the son of God, he is a divine being. So yeah, you got Judaism, believes in the same Abraham and God that we as Christians believe. And then um, there's some other branches of that who also believe in Abraham God, like uh, Islam religions. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that but then i think the one religion that you could say okay here's some competition is uh is hinduism of india because they believe that there's several gods they believe in polytheism that there's like hundreds of gods and it's like okay but my Wait, argument if you, if is you like, stop is if you stop to think about and look at all the gods that they have yeah. you know they represent different forces of nature right in in our world right like you know, the God of, of fire, the God of, of, you know, rain, you know, the, these different gods that they pray to, you know, for, for, for different things to happen in the world. Right. And the for way I see forces. it, I see a, a flaw and I don't know, let's see if you can get this too. Like people have a flaw in polytheism. Like, what do you think the flaw would be in, in, poly, in believing in many gods? Well, I mean, I guess the, the, the first one that comes to mind is, you know, if you're praying to different gods, then, you know, are you just having different relationships with different gods and maybe one of them you're leaving behind. And so that God might get mad at you for not praying to them as much as the other gods, or I guess, you know, I, I, I think, how, how does that work? You know, if you attribute the, the different events in life to different gods, you know, it's, I guess I'm thinking about it more in a human perspective, like relationship wise, the way that we see the, uh, the Christianic God, right. The, the relationship that we have, you know, as humans to a divine creator, you know, if you have several divine creators or yeah, divine, exactly. you know, that's my point, you, you know, know, yeah. Right. It, like, me, it's more irrational to believe that there's more than one creator than to believe in one creator because then you get the chicken or egg argument. Well, then if that create, if two creators, even two, even three, created the universe, then which creator created that creator and which creator came before the other creator? But then I guess you could argue, well, they've always existed since the dawn of time. Like I believe that about God, about the one God that we believe in, is that God has existed outside time. So therefore, he's always, that, that's what they mean by eternal. People can't grasp what they mean by eternal. It's like it's just existed outside of the four dimensions of time, of time and space that we live in. And yeah. there are dimensions outside the fourth dimension of time. Like, and, and science, let's talk about that theory. a little bit because I, I, I really uh, I think we've, we've talked about the different dimensions and the possibility of, of that existing, which I just find fascinating because once you once you start living, you know, outside of the fourth dimension, which is, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's time, right? Right. Once you live outside of time, you know, that's how you can have omnipresence. You know, you can be at different points in different times of, of people's lives 
because you live outside of time, right? Right. You know, exactly, and, dude. I and essentially, so when we pray, you know, those prayers, you know, the reason why you know they're they're so powerful is because they reach in a way outside of 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 um of time. They they go into this area, and I don't want to sound too woo woo for for those just listening to us, but you know. If it's reaching the creator, you know, if our prayers are actually reaching the creator and the creator lives outside of time, then our prayers are going and reaching, going outside of time as well. Yeah. Well, and even if you don't believe in God, the thing about prayer is prayer can have this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy thing. So you can still argue that prayer is a form of meditation. And some people acknowledge it, acknowledge it to be that kind of like self meditation to where you're, you're, you're praying for these things that you want to change about yourself and maybe other people, depending on what you're praying about. And it kind of becomes a self fulfilling prophecy because you're like, if you think a certain way and you start believing a certain way, then you're going to act that way. And the world around you is going to respond in the same way, kind of. And it's a chain reaction. Dude. Yeah, dude. Yeah. It's pretty Wait, interesting. I, I wanted to, to get your perspective on, on, um, uh dimensions you know the, the different dimensions what, what have you researched about? yeah the more the more honestly the more I've, I've dived into that the more i realize i don't know exactly what i'm talking about and i find that i'm out of my reach if that makes sense like when i initially got into it i was like okay that's really cool so albert einstein believed that there's a fourth dimension of time that our physical dimension is in and that if you go outside and then other people would add to that and say okay so if you go outside this fourth dimension of time into like i guess a fifth dimension or whatever then that means you exist outside of the beginning and the end of time. So you're literally eternal, technically. Like you're, that means, philosophically like speaking, that means you would be able to see all of time laid out in front of you in 3D forever. Like you everything know, and, at once. And, and that's just, you know, to, to give people context of what that, what that means. You know, let's say when you do a drawing, right? That's a two-dimensional, you know, line, right? Let's say you draw a line on paper. That's a two-dimensional line that you can see yourself, right? Because you live in the third dimension, right? In the physical reality. And so, you know, right there and there, you know, you're just seeing a line. But if I lived, right? If I lived in the second dimension, I would just see a dot, right? Because that dot, I'm living inside that second dimension. I just see that okay. continuous dot that's going straight, right? Right. Exactly. Until it finishes the drawing, right? Like until it gets to a certain point. Uh, but that's that's all I see, right? And so it, since we live in the third dimension, you know, we can see the whole line, right? And then if we lived outside of the fourth dimension, which is the one that, you know, the, t- the time compass, um, then, like you said, we can see all of time. We live, you know, in the beginning and the end. And I think that's such a it's such a beautiful thing because you know in the Catholic Church we believe God to be the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Right. You know, it all started with with Him, and you know, eventually, if if the world does come to an end, it will end with Him, right? Omnipresence, so, or, or him or her. <laughs> I don't know yeah. what to, to we, uh, we believe that God is omnipresent, right? And so that means he must see all of time. And that that doesn't actually go against contemporary science on the idea of being outside the fourth dimension of time, because if you are then you're omnipresent, right? Because everything's in front of you. But yeah, that was a really good metaphor. That's uh, the um, I forgot the name of it, but there's a book that was written about that metaphor. You're talking about the lines. Mm-hmm. how you perceive things differently in different dimensions like we perceive we perceive time as linear but in reality it's probably more complicated than that um because we're stuck in this third dimension i guess technically we're in a fourth dimension right but if we're outside that it would radically change the way we view time it's like we wouldn't be able to handle it you know but yeah. I, there's one other thing that i wanted to touch on with you is almost here. like a black hole right like right you know, outside you, it. you yourself, your physical self would not be able to exist in the for in the outside of time just because it would happen just like what a black hole does, you know, just mixes things up and, you know, moves things around. You know, you would not be able to survive 
right. black hole. Yeah, yeah, as a human. Because being. time in, inside a black hole is just constantly moving and changing. Yeah, it's a mystery. We don't entirely even know. It's like uh, black holes are a mystery, that's for sure. Yeah. It's called a singularity inside the black hole, which I think is a term that means we don't know what that is. And I'm probably butchering that, but the main thing, though, out of all of this philosophical stuff we've talked about, and that's only just a small portion of the book, but the biggest one for me is the idea of near-death experiences. That's what convinced me personally, mm. uh, freshman year at St. Mary's, when I started reading all these books. And these books are published by doctors. And, you know, people want to argue, well, these people are just making like up doctors these in, in, stuff, you know? In what specifically? Oh, like uh, medical doctors. Medical. Yeah, okay. medical. Yeah. So I'm like, these people, you know, they're professional. They're medical doctors. They studied biology. And many of them were atheists before or agnostic before they found out about these near-death experiences and the common argument uh, from the atheist or agnostic is like, well, they, they're just making this stuff up so they can make money off the book. And I'm like, well, mm. but they're a medical doctor. That's my, my counter argument is this. They're, they're a medical doctor. How much more money? Do Their they reputation. Have? They already have, line. but they're already making a lot of money though. That's the thing. If you're a doctor, you're already bringing in a lot of money. Why would you need, why would you, what's your motivation? Yeah, You're putting your name on the line. Yeah. What's your motivation like to put out a book? Yeah, credibility too. That's another good point. But like, I'm like, why did? What's their motivation to make more money if they're already making a lot of money, like with the book, you know? So I, I don't think. I'm not saying I'm not going to completely rule it out, but at the same time, these near death experiences are fascinating. There was a, uh, there's actually been several. But there was this one case with a girl who was blind since birth, and she had a near death experience, and she saw things, you know, in heaven in this higher dimension. I like to think of heaven as like a higher dimension outside of our dimensions that we know of to make it more, I guess, contemporary, but it's the same. It means the same thing. It's just different words. Words are always mm -hmm. going to change, but that's what I think of it. At. And it's fascinating. She was blind since birth. They were arguing. These doctors were saying, it just doesn't make sense. How can she, you know, see all this stuff like a tree? She can identify a tree in heaven and all that stuff. If she's never seen it the whole life. You know what? And, now, right now, since we're talking about death, you know, and, you know, death being one of the doors to actually, you know, come close to, to divineness and maybe, you know, heaven, right? Made me think, you know, in, in Jesus, you know, time, you know, when he died, he said he opened salvation for everyone, right? He opened the doors to heaven. And if he did open the doors to heaven, which is higher dimension, right? Right. That means that people that were living before who died were just staying in the the area of time, right? Like yeah. maybe it's what we consider yeah. ghosts, right? That never never have the chance to open the door into that higher dimension. So when Jesus died for us, right, right, in in a Christian sense, it, when Jesus died, he opened the door to that higher dimension. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, like, yeah, it is. You know, it, yeah. like, and that's like a our concept of, of like salvation, you know, was that door opening into that higher dimension? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you could do that with a lot of things in the Bible. You could explain like, well, these angels and the, and their, their meaning is messengers, you know? And, and so does that mean they're interdimensional beings? It's like, mm. I don't know. It's, it's interesting to think about. Yeah. And I feel like people don't want to, or they just don't think about it, I guess. I don't know. I'm sure there's plenty of you, but that's how I think about it, at least. Like, but, and then there's certain near-death experiences. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but, like, basically... You were saying that where, the girl saw different things when she was in heaven? Even though she was blind since birth, and she identified things and objects, even though she's never seen them because she's been blind since birth. Um, so that was fascinating. But there was another one where this girl uh, died on the operating table, and... She accurately, actually, this happened in not just that, but it happened in several cases of near death experiences because these doctors did statistical data analysis and stuff and they collected a lot of data. But there are several people who accurately described these medical procedures without any medical training, like after they woke up after the near death experience. And they, because then during the, the experience of dying, they went up above their body and they could see all of the doctors doing all the stuff. Like one of them was cardiac arrest and were trying to revive someone. And the patient was able to accurately describe, and this wasn't like in recent times. This was like in the 1990s. I could be wrong. 1990s. It was before YouTube and all that. So they wouldn't just watch videos and like, oh, this is how you do it. 
It's like, no, it wasn't like that. It's like they accurately describe these complicated medical procedures that flabbergasted doctors. They're, the doctors are like, it, it makes no sense how this patient could accurately describe exactly what happened. There was even a specific case where a patient described things that the surgeon said during the procedure that she, when she died, supposedly, specific thing, words they said and a song that was playing in the background because sometimes surgeons listen to music when they're doing surgery. And mm -hmm. she gave the, the exact words they said and the name of the song. And the doctors and nurses were like, what? The this makes no sense at all. How does she, how did this person do this? You know? yeah. And the, ironically, the person who said that uh, doesn't, didn't even believe in God before that, but then she started questioning it after, but she couldn't explain it either. Um, but yeah, I don't know if... And so, you know, if these people have near death experiences, have they seen, have they seen God? Have they, you know, have yeah, they, yeah. you said some of them have seen heaven, the concept yeah. of heaven? They've seen loved ones. There's been some where they saw God as this kind of extremely bright light. And they described the light as very thick, heavy, not like light on earth. Like they said, if they were human in the experience, that the light would literally kill them from the intensity of it, that humans can't handle the light of God. And that the light also comes with emotions. It projects emotions of love and stuff like that onto the person. And it like has weight, you know, which is crazy. And they say that colors are beyond anything on earth that they can't even be described. Mm. And yeah, a lot of stuff like it's fascinating because my argument is like, if they were just hallucinating all of this, one, how would they describe medical procedures accurately in the specific song and the thing the surgeon said? But also, blind people, how would they be able to see stuff? Or how, and also, why would all the near-death experiences have so many similarities between them across the board? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so there there is commonalities between There are, people. and it's shocking if you look at the statistics, how similar they are. It's like, what, this makes no sense. If, you're an, if, if I was an atheist, I'd be like, that makes no sense. You know, like, how do you explain this? Um, yeah, there has to be some, some truth to it. If different people die, come back, they see the same thing or similar things yeah. or, or their perception of, of that, you know, other reality is the same, then, you know, there must be some, some sort of, yeah, you know, truth and to it. Right. Exactly. Dude. And, and it's like, and there's another interesting thing is like, they're not exactly the same. Like they're the same in a sense of common themes. So like a light, a, a dark tunnel to where they go to a light, which I think of that's kind of like going to a portal to another dimension. That's how I look at it. A higher dimension of heaven because a lot of them start in the dark tunnel and then they go to this light and maybe the light is the portal. I don't know. Um, or, or seeing God or seeing relatives or describing medical procedures or being able to float above your body. Like those are common themes, right? But they're not going to be exactly the same because it would they wouldn't be. That's impossible. You know, even if it was if it's real, it's not going to be the same. Because if someone, if five people went to New York City downtown, they would all have a different description of the same area, right? Mm -hmm. No one describes things exactly the same way because everyone experiences things in their own way. So that's my argument. Yeah, for that. yeah, it's different testimonies of the same event, maybe, yeah, but everyone uses their own perception. Right, right. Of de to describe the the event. Yeah, exactly. So I guess um, we're almost out of time, but I was wondering if you want to touch on kind of your knowledge of it and maybe talk about the problem with evil or or something that that you think we should, you know, touch on. Yeah, and and you know, I think it's it's one of the things that you know morality and in God, it's something that you know ever since time, you know. We even say today, you know, what would Jesus do? You know, it's it's like that, that morality aspect with with religion. It's so so mixed together, you know. And I and I thought it was interesting because when I was taking a philosophy class, um, you know, our teacher was telling us that, you know, ethics, you know, should be separated from from religion. I think I thought that was really interesting because you know, there's there's a lot of philosophy behind that because. If, you know, if God does not exist, you know, like one, I think it's Kierkegaard said, God does not exist, then everything is possible, which means, you know, evil is possible. You could kill someone and, you know, other than being a law in human, in the humanity society, you know, if, 
I kill someone in the woods, you know, that's completely fine if nobody finds out about it. Right. And, and that's, that's the idea of, uh, you know, world without God. Right. You know, because there, there is no punishment afterwards or there's no, you know, life afterwards. So live right now while you can. And I think it brings us back to a, a very primitive uh, mentality, right? Very uh, survival concepts. So, you know, why give $5 to the person on the street? You know, if, you know, in your mind, you know, you can use it to buy, you know, something else, right? You earn that money. And so you should use it, you know, to buy food for yourself or for, for your kid, right? It, it brings us back to a very self-seeking interest, right? You know, if, if in reality there is no God, you know, why do things for others, right? You know, is it, it, it could be, you know, it could be still in the self-interest of like, well, if I give, you know, $5 to this person, you know, and it's, let's say for church, you know, maybe in the future, you know, they'll care for me. Yeah, uh, if I ever end up losing my job or something like that, or it could be in that sense, but still the the way it would be very very hard to really separate, you know, God from from morality in a way, just because the existence of so, of God in itself implies that there is you know a greater place where He exists. You know, and if we want to gain access to that, you know, we have to believe and follow what he does, which when he came, you know, we believe Jesus to be the, the God in, in person, human, in human form. Then he laid out kind of like the pathway to what it means to be a Christian. Right. And so uh, a follower of, of God. And, you know, I think that has a lot to do, you know, uh, you know, with how we live our lives. And of course, you know, even in the Bible, it says, you know, should we pay taxes to, to the Romans? Well, God was not against, you know, completely like the rules that were from, from, from man. Right. But he's basically saying like, well, pay, pay the Romans, what is to the Romans and God, what is to God. Right. But I think nowadays we're coming out with so many laws that sometimes, you know, do they really matter? You know, and, and it's it's uh it's a little laws, but you know, there there is some that help to bring order, like you know, having stop signs, of course, right? A stoplight or something like that to keep order in traffic, uh, different stuff like that that you know essentially bring organization into the world. You know, I think that that uh that's normal because in itself you know like you said the problem of evil evil still exists in the world right hence why you know human made laws are to to keep partly that evil from happening but you know in itself everything's arbitrary if you stop to think about it you know a law what is a law you know because sometimes like for example let me give you a, a great example the other day I was with my girlfriend. Uh, we went to the movies, right? To not the, the movies, but a drive-in movie theater. We were going to go get some popcorn. There was like some lines that were created, you know, separating the restroom with where you can buy popcorn. So you literally had to go outside of the door and then go in through the other side to get, get into the area where there was popcorn. But the only thing separating you where the restrooms were, where I was to that popcorn area was just some cones. Yeah. Right. So I was like, well, why have to go around if I can just, you know, step, you yeah, know, but if take you do, a step, in trouble. Yeah. and I'm already in it to, yeah. there to buy the popcorn. I don't want to go outside and do that whole, whole thing. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a great area, right? I'm not killing anyone. I'm not, you know, and that goes into the idea. Well, you know, how, how big is a sin? You know, if you kill someone or cross a line into going to get popcorn, when oh, somebody yeah, said, Oh yeah, dude, we could someone. do an entire podcast on that by itself. 
that yeah, that, that, that idea. That's a very yeah. true. Um, but I will yeah, say but that. I think yeah, for, for at the yeah. at the end of my my think, I guess you know, morality in itself and the problem of evil, you know, entails that you know, if there's an evil, there's a good, right? Right. There's there's always a polarity in 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 the world. If you stop to think about it, you know, there's always with where there's light, there's always shadows. Where there is a positive energy, there's always a negative energy, right? You know, that's that's how batteries work. That's a lot how a lot of things work, you know, and right. a lot that's of a... electromagnetic things in, in this world. And uh electromagnetic meaning there's you know uh an electricity, a message being sent out and a magnet, magnetic something bringing it in. So there's always like a flow of motion. Even we are electromagnetic beings, you know. And that's why, you know, when somebody gets shocked by, by lightning, you know, it, it really harms us uh, because we, uh, we are electromagnetic beings. We are conductors. And so there's many things, you know, that we could go down into a rabbit hole. Oh, yeah, with, but Yeah, we could do another know, podcast on moral relativism, which is the new kind of way of seeing morality. Yeah. That's Ooh, that, reminds me of. that could be the next episode. <laughs> yeah, I'm down. I'm down. Because, uh, but I'll say this, like before my last statement, I guess, would be like, uh, going back on where we started in the beginning, because um, uh, I've talked to atheists and stuff, and I have plenty of friends with different beliefs, so I, I, I also see the point of view of like, uh, not saying that atheists don't have morals just because they don't believe in God, you know what I mean? Like, just because they, but I also understand the argument of, god is the source of morality at least that's what me and you personally believe as as christians who believe in the creator Uh, Mm -hmm. but at the same time i'm not i want to i guess make it clear like i'm not saying that atheists don't have morals just because they don't believe in god you know or they don't believe i guess in moral uh virtues i guess you know because that that can be stereotyped sometimes like that atheists have no morals or what have you you know because yeah, there, there is a lot of philosophers yeah. that say, well, maybe morality is innate, just like a yeah. mother learns to care for its baby, right? Or, you know, a packed pack of uh, elephants learn to take care of themselves to yeah. protect each other from from dangerous animals. Yeah, dude, we should talk about this on our next podcast because uh, there is a lot more to say for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well. I guess that that'll be a, a nice cliffhanger to, <laughs> to yeah, end right. the podcast. That's, that's how we get y'all hooked, you know. We leave on a <laughs> Sounds good, Steel. Well, uh, thank you for uh for coming in today. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, if you are here at the end of the podcast, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, we have a lot more coming uh, in these next couple of months and weeks to uh you know talk about outside of the box ideas, and hopefully you find this intriguing. If you like this, give it a thumbs up and we'll see you in the next episode.